The Desire of Ages, Chapter 54, The Good Samaritan. In the story of the Good Samaritan, Christ illustrates the nature of true religion. He shows that it consists not in systems, creeds or rites, but in the performance of loving deeds, in bringing the greatest good to others, in genuine goodness. As Christ was teaching the people, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? With breathless attention, the large congregation awaited the answer. The priests and rabbis had thought to entangle Christ by having the lawyer ask this question. But the Saviour entered into no controversy. He required the answer from the questioner himself. What is written in the law? He said. How readest thou? The Jews still accused Christ of lightly regarding the law given from Sinai, but he turned the question of salvation upon the keeping of God's commandments. The lawyer said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. Jesus said, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. The lawyer was not satisfied with the position and works of the Pharisees. He had been studying the scriptures with a desire to learn their real meaning. He had a vital interest in the matter, and had asked in sincerity, What shall I do? In his answer as to the requirements of the law, he passed by all the mass of ceremonial and ritualistic precepts. For these he claimed no value, but presented the two great principles on which hang all the law and the prophets. This answer, being commended by Christ, placed the Saviour on vantage ground with the rabbis. They could not condemn him for sanctioning that which had been advanced by an expositor of the law. This do, and thou shalt live, Jesus said. He presented the law as a divine unity and in this lesson taught that it is not possible to keep one precept and break another, for the same principle runs through them all. Man's destiny will be determined by his obedience to the whole law. Supreme love to God and impartial love to man are the principles to be wrought out in the life. The lawyer found himself a lawbreaker. He was convicted under Christ's searching words. The righteousness of the law, which he had claimed to understand, he had not practiced. He had not manifested love toward his fellow man. Repentance was demanded, but instead of repenting, he tried to justify himself. Rather than acknowledge the truth, he sought to show how difficult a fulfillment the commandment is. Thus he hoped to both parry conviction and to vindicate himself in the eyes of the people. The Saviour's words had shown that his question was needless, since he had been able to answer it himself. Yet he put another question, saying, Who is my neighbour? Among the Jews this question caused endless dispute. They had no doubt as to the heathen and the Samaritans. These were strangers and enemies. But where should the distinction be made among the people of their own nation and among the different classes of society? Whom should the priest, the rabbi, the elder regard as neighbor? They spent their lives in a round of ceremonies to make themselves pure. Contact with the ignorant and careless multitude they taught would cause defilement that would require wearisome effort to remove. Were they to regard the unclean as neighbours? Again, Jesus refused to be drawn into controversy. He did not denounce the bigotry of those who were watching to condemn him. But by a simple story, he held up before his hearers such a picture of the outflowing of heaven-born love as touched all hearts and drew from the lawyer a confession of the truth. The way to dispel darkness is to admit light. The best way to deal with error is to present truth. 
It is the revelation of God's love that makes manifest the deformity and sin of the heart centered in self. A certain man, said Jesus, was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers which both stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance a certain priest was going down that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And in like manner, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. This was no imaginary scene, but an actual occurrence, which was known to be exactly as represented. The priest and the Levite, who had passed by on the other side, were in the company that listened to Christ's words. In journeying from Jerusalem to Jericho, the traveller had to pass through a portion of the wilderness of Judea. The road led down a wild, rocky ravine, which was infested by robbers, and was often the scene of violence. It was here that the traveller was attacked, stripped of all that was valuable, wounded and bruised, and left half dead by the wayside. As he lay thus, the priest came that way, but he merely glanced toward the wounded man. Then the Levite appeared, curious to know what had happened. He stopped and looked at the sufferer. He was convicted of what he ought to do, but it was not an agreeable duty. He wished that he had not come that way, so that he need not have seen the wounded man. He persuaded himself that the case was no concern of his. Both these men were in sacred office and professed to expound the scriptures. They were of the class specially chosen to be representatives of God to the people. They were to have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, that they might lead men to understand God's great love toward humanity. The work they were called to do was the same that Jesus had described as his own when he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised. The angels of heaven look upon the distress of God's family upon the earth, and they are prepared to cooperate with men in relieving oppression and suffering. God in his providence had brought the priest and the Levite along the road where the wounded sufferer lay, that they might see his need of mercy and help. All heaven watched to see if the hearts of these men would be touched with pity for human woe. The Saviour was the one who had instructed the Hebrews in the wilderness from the pillar of cloud and of fire. He had taught a very different lesson from that which the people were now receiving from their priests and teachers. The merciful provisions of the law extended even to the lower animals, which cannot express in words their want and suffering. Directions had been given to Moses for the children of Israel to this effect. If thou meet thine enemy's ox or his ass going astray, thou shalt surely bring it back to him again. If thou see the ass of him that hateth thee lying under his burden, and wouldest forbear to help him, thou shalt surely help him. But in the man wounded by robbers, Jesus presented the case of a brother in suffering. How much more should their hearts have been moved with pity for him than for a beast of burden? The message had been given them through Moses that the Lord their God, a great God, a mighty and a terrible, doth execute the judgment of the fatherless and widow and loveth the stranger. Wherefore he commanded, Love ye therefore the stranger, thou shalt love him, as thyself. The stranger did not lodge in the street, but I opened my doors to the traveller. And when the two angels in the guise of men came to Sodom, Lot bowed and said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night. With all these lessons the priest and the Levite were familiar, 
but they had not brought them into practical life. Trained in the school of national bigotry, they had become selfish, narrow, and exclusive. When they looked upon the wounded man, they could not tell whether he was of their nation or not. They thought he might be of the Samaritans, and they turned away. In their action, as Christ had described it, the lawyer saw nothing contrary to what he had been taught concerning the requirements of the law. But now another scene was presented. A certain Samaritan in his journey came where the sufferer was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. He did not question whether the stranger was a Jew or a Gentile. If a Jew, the Samaritan well knew that if their condition was reversed, the man would spit in his face and pass him by with contempt. But he did not hesitate on account of this. He did not consider that he himself might be in danger of violence by tarrying in the place. It was enough that there was before him a human being in need and suffering. He took off his own garment with which to cover him. The oil and wine provided for his own journey he used to heal and refresh the wounded man. He lifted him on his own beast and moved slowly along with even pace so that the stranger might not be jarred and made to suffer increased pain. He brought him to an inn and cared for him through the night, watching him tenderly. In the morning, as the sick man had improved, the Samaritan ventured to go on his way. But before doing this, he placed him in the care of the innkeeper, paid the charges, and left a deposit for his benefit. And not satisfied even with this, he made provision for any further need, saying to the host, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. The story ended. Jesus fixed his eyes upon the lawyer, in a glance that seemed to read his soul, and said, Which of these three thinkest thou? proved neighbor unto him that fell among the robbers. The lawyer would not, even now, take the name of Samaritan upon his lips, and he made answer, He that showed mercy on him. Jesus said, Go, and do thou likewise. Thus the question, Who is my neighbor, is forever answered. Christ has shown that our neighbor does not mean merely one of the church or faith to which we belong. It has no reference to race, color, or class distinction. Our neighbor is every person who needs our help. Our neighbor is every soul who is wounded and bruised by the adversary. Our neighbor is everyone who is the property of God. In the story of the Good Samaritan, Jesus gave a picture of himself and his mission. Man had been deceived, bruised, robbed, and ruined by Satan, and left to perish. But the Savior had compassion on our helpless condition. He left his glory to come to our rescue. He found us ready to die, and he undertook our case. He healed our wounds. He covered us with his robe of righteousness. He opened to us a refuge of safety and made complete provision for us at his own charges. He died to redeem us. Pointing to his own example, he says to his followers, These things I command you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. The lawyer's question to Jesus had been, what shall I do? And Jesus, recognizing love to God and man, as the sum of righteousness had said, this do, and thou shalt live. The Samaritan had obeyed the dictates of a kind and loving heart, and in this had proved himself a doer of the law. Christ bade the lawyer, go, and do thou likewise. Doing and not saying merely is expected of the children of God. 
He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. The lesson is no less needed in the world today than when it fell from the lips of Jesus. Selfishness and cold formality have well nigh extinguished the fire of love and dispelled the graces that should make fragrant the character. Many who profess his name have lost sight of the fact that Christians are to represent Christ. Unless there is practical self-sacrifice for the good of others in the family circle, in the neighborhood, in the church, and wherever we may be, then whatever our profession, we are not Christians. Christ has linked his interest with that of humanity, and he asks us to become one with him for the saving of humanity. Freely ye have received, he says. Freely give. Sin is the greatest of all evils, and it is ours to pity and help the sinner. There are many who err and who feel their shame and their folly. They are hungry for words of encouragement. They look upon their mistakes and errors until they are driven almost to desperation. These souls we are not to neglect. If we are Christians, we shall not pass by on the other side keeping as far as possible from the very ones who most need our help. When we see human beings in distress, whether through affliction or through sin, we shall never say, this does not concern me. Ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness. By faith and prayer, press back the power of the enemy Speak words of faith and courage that will be as a healing balsam to the bruised and wounded one. Many, many have fainted and become discouraged in the great struggle of life when one word of kindly cheer would have strengthened them to overcome. Never should we pass by one suffering soul without seeking to impart to him of the comfort wherewith we are comforted of God. All this is but a fulfillment of the principle of the law, the principle that is illustrated in the story of the Good Samaritan and made manifest in the life of Jesus. His character reveals the true significance of the law and shows what is meant by loving our neighbor as ourselves. And when the children of God manifest mercy kindness and love toward all men. They are also witnessing to the character of the statutes of heaven. They are bearing testimony to the fact that the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. And whoever fails to manifest this love is breaking the law which he professes to revere. For the spirit we manifest toward our brethren declares what is our spirit toward God. The love of God in the heart is the only spring of love toward our neighbor. If a man say, I love God and hateth his neighbor, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? Beloved, if we love one another, God dwelleth in us and his love is perfected in us.